We will now start the webinar as a few more people join in. Welcome to everybody who is joining this cultural exchange and creative communities webinar organized by Fulbright Greece. This is a recorded session and a recorded version will be made available on the Fulbright Greek Greece website. We will start off with part one for which we have scheduled 30 minutes. We invite you to submit your questions through the Q&A function of your Zoom screen. We will then filter the questions and depending on the time available at the end of the first session, we will respond to some selected ones. We are delighted to come together today. I will be your host. My name is Els Siakos Hanape, Fulbright Greek Program Coordinator, and I will now pass on the microphone to Fulbright Greece Executive Director Artemis Zanetou. Artemis, can we please bring you in? Thank you, Els. Good evening, Kalispera. Fulbright is the flagship international educational and cultural exchange program of the United States in partnership with more than 160 countries worldwide. It offers programs for passionate and accomplished students, scholars, artists, teachers, and professionals of all backgrounds to study, teach, conduct research, exchange ideas, and contribute to finding solutions to complex global challenges. In 2021, we celebrate 75 years of the Fulbright program's history of positive impact on the lives of individuals, as well as on global and local communities. Fulbright Greece takes pride in operating the oldest Fulbright program in Europe and the second globally. Since 1948, it has awarded more than 6,000 scholarships to Greek and US citizens, a substantial number of which were awarded to practicing artists and creative individuals. In the last decade, we have developed the Art Sports Education Initiative, Fulbright Alumni Art Series, a grassroots fundraising program to help raise funds for scholarships. This was achieved with the invaluable support of Fulbright Artists Alumni. To date, more than 30 Fulbright Alumni artists have donated works of art to help raise funds for the Fulbright Artist Scholarship Program. We hope that through this program, you will be inspired and interested to for a Fulbright scholarship. The first part of the webinar will review the US residency landscape, discuss insights on how to prepare a successful portfolio. And in the US alone, there are hundreds of artist residencies that provide space to creative professionals of all disciplines. But what is an artist residency? What does it provide? To whom is it addressed? How can you select the right one? How do you prepare a successful portfolio? It is a pleasure to introduce you our speaker, Dr. Lydia Matthews, Professor of Visual Culture in the Fine Arts Program of Parsons School of Design and Director of the Curatorial Design Research Lab at the New School and a Fulbright alumna who came to Greece in academic year 2011-2012 at the University of Thessaline Volos. Lydia Matthews is a Brooklyn and Athens-based critical writer, contemporary art curator, educator, and cultural activist. Lydia will speak about the value of creative residencies and creating a powerful portfolio. Lydia, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Els and uh, Artemis. It's always a great pleasure to be part of the Fulbright community. And I have a lot of material to cover with you today uh, to get through the what, why, who, where, and how of artists' residencies. So I wanted to begin actually with a kind of personal story because I've been very fortunate over the years to have a number of different kinds of uh, residencies, sometimes residencies as an artist, sometimes as a curator, sometimes as a writer. And I remember in 2012, uh, I, uh, which was actually the year of my, my Fulbright residency in, uh, or Fulbright fellowship rather in uh, Greece, I, I had a number of things planned and uh, out of the blue, I got a call from a curator in the United States asking if I might consider writing an essay for an exhibition they were doing on contemporary art 
and contemporary artists responding to time. And I remember I had so much going on at that time that I, I said to them, it just automatically came out of my mouth. Well, you know, I'm not really sure if I'm gonna have time to write about time. And I, as I said it, I heard myself and I thought that is the most ridiculous thing I have uh, that's come out of my mouth in a while. And I certainly must find a way to uh, have time to write about time. Uh, and so I, um, I sought out a writing residency, uh, actually a, a space on the island of Idra that I was lucky enough to have access to. And I'm showing you an image actually of a painting of exactly the room that I was in. And I bring this story up because out of this, I, I, it was not only, uh, I was going through a lot in my life at that moment, and it gave me um, a good three weeks to step back slow down and really begin to think about the topic of time from a whole new angle. And I'm showing you here uh, a, you know, a little screenshot of the, of the page of the essay that I wrote for that catalog. It's actually on my website if you're interested, but I, I bring this into view only because I wanted just to read the first paragraph to you um, just so that you could see the way in which the place of a, of a residency can seep into one's thinking about whatever it is that they're working mm -hmm. on. Uh, Lydia, you might yeah. want to share your own screen. Oh, so we so can see far. the slide. Uh -huh. yeah, no so problem. Uh, thank you. Just one second. Okay. Perfect, perfect. Great. Um, Thank so this, you. this was the painting that uh, it was of my room. And um, this is the, the, uh, gen the, the, the essay that was generated. And so what I said was on the, on the Mediterranean island of Idra in the summer of 2012, melodic bells, church bells sound off through the day to structure the local people's quotidian rhythms. Life is navigated on foot through cobblestone pathways with cars replaced by donkeys, the faint scent of the dung mixing with jasmine or oregano leaves and pine. Things move slowly, deliberately, sped up only when the tourist boats arrive or deport, depart from the port's edge. From the labyrinthine streets to its inhabitants daily patterns that shift according to the sun's intensity, Idra defies a paradigm of time that plagues much of the rest of the world. So I think if you continue, you, you would see that this was something that really, uh, as I said, seeped into the work. And I think that's one of the beauties of art artist residencies is they take you into a different kind of space that because of the, uh, the newness and the freshness of, a, of, of seeing from a different vantage point, it influences how you think. So I want to take you through now um, what cons you know a number of questions of what constitutes an artist in residence. I'm going to reference it uh, by saying air from here on out. Um, I you know more than anything, it is a unique and temporary live work space, and. Uh, as I showed you that room in, on the, in Idra in the fine arts annex was that for me um, during that one particular residency. However, I would say in the United States, there are also quite a few local residencies that can be non-residential and that can provide you perhaps access to a studio, but not a live space or equipment and or mentorship. So I just wanted to show you an example of that kind of thing. Um, this is a place called the Textile Arts Center in New York City. And um, the residency here is set up almost as if uh, it's, it's you know, a mentorship, but it's set up almost as if it, it's a continuation of a kind of intensive school-like environment. So you're given a studio, but then also, uh, it culminates in an exhibition, and that sometimes happens. This one happens to be set up so that the first three months are about play and exploration. Then you might be researching or developing a concept, and then ultimately project creation and a show. So there uh, are times when in it's set up in that way. This is a place where you don't live, but you certainly get immersed in a total program. Um, 
Other, uh, you know, pragmatics of the structures of, of residencies, some of them are structured thematically um, and others are to totally open-ended. Some are, you know, require engagement with audiences. Sometimes open houses happen uh, during residencies and others pride themselves on leaving you alone and, and do not require any kind of creative outcomes. Others are, are geared to specific kinds of practices because of their mission or because of the nature of their facilities. So a lot of residencies are very specific, like the textile one that I just showed you, or a ceramics or a painting or glass or digital arts, uh, also writing, curating, performance, et cetera. So they vary tremendously. So too do the costs. Some heirs are fully funded and include everything it takes to live, to travel, to, and it often will sometimes even give you a stipend as well. Others require residential fees. Uh, for example, uh, uh, it might be something like 800 euro for five weeks. Um, it, they vary, of course, but they don't give you travel. However, if they're charging you, you should definitely find out whether or not they provide any uh, competitive scholarships, because that is often the case. <clears throat> so it, it, don't let that deter you initially. Find out a little bit more. Um, many, but not all, residencies require non-refundable application fees. They don't cost much, maybe about 10 or 20 euro. But if you're facing serious financial challenges, you know, talk with the residency staff to see if that can be waived, because most of the time people uh, very much want a kind of inclusive uh, possibility for their residents. In terms of food and uh, family, um, some places will provide prepared meals. Um, sometimes they're shared in collective spaces. Other times they're literally, you know, delivered to your door. Uh, others offer a collective self-service kitchen for cooking. Um, some, some residencies welcome partners and families, but I have to say that most do not. This is really in many ways an opportunity to uh, you know, have time for yourself. Um, so you would have to dig to really find the ones where you could bring someone along with you. Uh, they do exist though. And in terms of time commitments, uh, the durations are very wide ranging. They might be two weeks, they might be up to a year or more. Uh, most I would say are, are more in the one to three month range, but again, they vary and you have to look uh, for what makes sense for you. Um, in terms of location, some of them are in urban areas and arts centers. Uh, here are a couple in New York or three uh, in New York, one in Brooklyn. Um, and that is, you know, if you're looking, if you live in a place where you're kind of hungering for access to not only studio spaces, but also museum collections and galleries, then you might want to choose a big urban center that has a lot of artistic activity and performance going on. Um, other times uh, there are residencies that, um, this is another one that happens to be in New York, but this one is uh, specifically modeled around the idea of a kind of DIY artist collective community. And so if you go to this one, rather than having a solitary kind of experience, you might suddenly find yourself, or you would suddenly find yourself um, as part of a community that is um, asked to work collaboratively. Um, sometimes uh, the antithesis of the ones in New York are the very rural and quiet uh, residencies. Um, the Rabbit Island residency, for example, there on the uh, left, you know, it's just uh, simply an island that's extremely remote. And um, that is its pull for some people who are yearning for absolute solitude. Um, other times they are almost suburban. Uh, there might be um, interesting architectural structures like this one in East Haddam, Connecticut, uh, or, um, oops, let me go back here for a second. Um, the McDowell, uh, which is one of the oldest and most established in the United States, is almost like a whole campus, like a little village, so to speak, with a lot of different kinds of homes uh, and structures and cottages where um, each individual artist has a space. So 
Um, there's really not a singular kind of form that these takes. Also, sometimes they are incorporated into other kinds of institutions, like artists in residencies in the National Park Service in the United States. Um, you can look into that or uh, joint industry arts uh, collaboration so uh, that a, a kind of factory environment might be opened up to artists to uh, think about making work and having access to that kind of environment. Also, there are uh, residencies such as the Arctic Circle one, one of many that are bringing together uh, uh, people from different disciplines, particularly the arts and the sciences, to uh, have, uh, uh, you know, to, to board a boat together and go up to the Arctic and uh, have uh, cross-disciplinary research opportunities for thinking about issues like climate change. And now, you know, in the age of pandemics, of course, uh, sometimes it's been, you know, this year has been really hard to bring people together in the kind of very intimate uh, collective environment, but also solitary environment of one studio that many residency offers uh, uh, offer. But there are increasingly more and more virtual and remote um, artists in residence in the uh, age of pandemics. So sometimes they might give stipends that enable you to turn your home into a uh, your own residency more um, effectively, or to uh, have exchanges um, you know, across cultures that are virtual. So why seek out a residency? Many, many reasons. First of all, um, to create, to absolutely support creative sustainability. We all know that when you're working, um, you know, it's just really difficult sometimes to juggle all of the things that a, a working artist has to uh, manage. And so for your own physical and mental health, you might just need a break and you might need a change of environment uh, so that you can have some space to think and get back in touch with that inner voice. Um, sometimes you might be caught in a rut or you might be um, at, at kind of ready for something new and you need a space to have some experimentation, either materially or conceptually. And uh, residencies are great for that. Other times you might be very, very eager to complete a project. You need certain kinds of equipment or you need the time that you just haven't been able to manage um, in, your, in your sort of day-to-day -day life. So, um, you know, it might be about taking what you've been doing and bringing it to completion. Another thing that sometimes isn't as obvious is that uh, because I think we think about almost artist residents like retreats, but in fact, they're ways of uh, getting more visibility for yourself and also accessing a very extant, you know, expanding professional networks. So not only do you create a kind of network with the other people who might be in residence and certain uh, of the residencies like the McDowell, for example, that I was showing you often will curate groups of people because they think it's an, they would be very interesting with one another. Um, but sometimes also residencies will arrange studio visits with local curators and critics, or like that textile uh, art center example, um, create a kind of curriculum or structure to develop within. And finally, um, there are if there are residencies that have themes um, that are always changing, uh, this, this might provide you with an opportunity to dig into a theme more deeply, to have dialogue uh, and a space of research. So who do artist residencies serve? Um, usually when you look into a residency, it will describe who they're looking to support. Um, they might be residencies that are geared more toward emerging artists, uh, people who are transitioning out of school environments. Sometimes they're very keen to support particular kinds of disciplines, like there are ceramic specific, for example, or digital uh, design specific residencies. But other ones really pride themselves on being multidisciplinary and bringing people together from a lot of different kinds of practices. 
Other uh, residencies are really made for people who are mid-career, who have just are juggling the demands of a, a day job or family responsibilities. And as I said before, who just simply need a break or some space. Uh, and then there are, there are uh, residencies that uh, are very attractive to more mature practitioners with longstanding careers. And there are, are sometimes are uh, very deliberate multi-generational mixes so that older people and younger people can teach each other the things that they are uh, you know, versed in. Uh, and uh, as I pointed out on the boat residency, there are uh, some that look for multidisciplinary collaborators, people who maybe are already working on collaborative teams or who want to cross pollinate around a particular topic like climate change. So I also wanted to uh, point out that uh, more and more there are residencies that really are there to um, uh, support, oops, uh, uh, BIPOC artists. And I'm just putting a couple of them down here. Oops. Um, I'm trying to get my cursor to come back on the screen. It seems to have not wanted to do that. But I, um, I you know, we will, uh, you'll, you'll be able to look into these. But the, the Indigo Arts Alliance in Maine, which was founded by uh, an artist and his wife, um, Daniel and Mar Marsha Minter, um, that is really specifically to support people from, um, you know, basically brown and, and black artists who are of African descent. Uh, and there are more and more, even within residencies, like for example, uh, this other one that I'm showing you, which is uh, the website link to uh, the Corning Glass Museum. They have recently developed amongst their many residencies, one that's specifically for black and indigenous people of color. So that um, is another thing uh, that is um, increasingly visible now. Now, where do you find artist residencies? Um, there are some great websites that will be wonderful resources for you. Um, Res Artists is one of the oldest and most uh, uh, you know, substantial, and it's actually from, from around the world. Uh, but there are also res, uh, websites that are focused part, part, particularly on fully funded residencies. So there are a couple of those. And also I'm giving you a link for a very, if a really excellent overview of a lot of different uh, residencies in the United States. Um, once you find the program that appeals, um, you want to look at uh, through their websites to see who attended. Usually they will feature, and this is another way in which uh, the residencies can promote your own visibility as an artist because they will usually feature the people who are in residence. And um, I think it's really important to ask yourself, do I make a good match when you see who was there before? Is this my career stage? And is this my creative practice that I see um, similarly reflected in these people? Could I imagine thriving in this physical environment and social and artistic community? And what characteristics would I offer to this place? Because it's very much a two-way street. And I think that's important to think about. How do I get in? or the importance of a strategic application and portfolio. I wanna go into some detail with that, um, uh, with you on that as well. Applications vary from site, uh, site to site, but typically you need to have an artist CV. If that's not something that's so familiar to you, there are a lot of resources online now to help you write a good artist CV. Uh, artist statement and or residency project description. Uh, a portfolio, and sometimes they ask for letters of recommendation. So to open this up a little bit more, I just want to you to think a bit more about the content of putting together a strong portfolio. I think the best thing is to think of the application as a text image story about who you are as an artist. So the CV, the statement, and the imagery should all work together to produce a very clear picture of who you are and why this residency is a good fit. So you want in your writing to describe where you're coming from, what interests you, how, to, uh, how you make work, maybe some of the research methods, material choices, techniques. 
you want to tell them about how you imagine using their residency and really convince them that this opportunity will allow you to re realize your goal. So be sure to do your homework and reference the kinds of things that they're offering you. Uh, be honest, be clear, enthusiastic, and avoid jargon, uh, jargon at all costs. Let your voice and your personality shine through. As far as logistics go, stick to the exact word count and don't leave it to the last minute. I say that because more and more, if they tell you uh, there are 250 word limits, they will often cut you off at 250 words. So you wanna be able to have it exact and edit it in advance and not be scrambling at the last minute to shorten it. Um, you wanna show work that's recent, no more than three years old to make sure that it's relatively co coherent body of work and not an overview of every single skill set you have. And what I mean by a coherent body of work, it might be something that's like a series of things that you're working on, but it can also include a range of media or projects that look diverse, but explore a particular theme or research interest. And um, you should never give more than the number of images or samples they request. One work can be shown uh, at, you know, through an overall image and then some details uh, and that help the, the viewer become a little more engaged in the work. If it's an installation view, that can help provide a sense of the scale and the presentation. Like for example, if these are a couple of paintings that an artist has made, okay, you can see them as singular objects, but then you might wanna show an image of uh, them installed in a space so that the viewer can immediately get a sense of, of um, how they take up space in the world. Um, and if they're a project that, it, you know, lives outside of a conventional frame, um, like these paintings are actually um, loose on uh, an unstretched canvas by the same artist and, and, and put out into uh, an environment. These are the kinds of ways in which the overview, the setting, and the details can really give a much fuller picture of what this person's work is about. Um, so always include the title, the medium, dimensions, date, and annotate a little bit if they give you the space. In other words, give a very succinct description, um, some narrative content that helps the jurors understand what they're seeing. But be conscious and considerate of their time. So if you include a video or an audio work, make sure that it's not more than five or 10 minutes max or provide an edited compilation because you've got to remember that the jurors are probably looking at dozens if not more than a hundred applications. And so you want to be really considerate and do the work for them. Do not make the juror have to piece together your application's puzzle parts. Make sure it all works as a whole. And then uh, finally, with letters of recommendation, make sure that your residency project plans are shared with your recommend re recommenders at least two or three or even four weeks in advance of the deadline. And if you know any artists who were previously in residence at that place, ask them to be the ones to write for you. So remember that success is not always immediate. Often it can take more than one application to a place before you get in. And each time you apply, you have the opportunity to improve or reply, refine your application skills. And more and more people who are jurying for that residency, even if you don't get it, as well as the staff people become familiar with your work. So it's, it is very much effort worth making. And this is all part of building your professional network. So um, that's what I'm going to leave you. And if anyone has questions, we can um, talk about things or I'm also more than happy to have you email me at any time. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Lydia. Sure. Uh, this is a very insightful uh, presentation, particularly for our artists and the creative professionals among us. Um, I'm afraid we don't have much time left for questions right now. Uh, there will be more, some more time at the end of the webinar. There was somebody though who asked if we can share the links that you have in the PowerPoint. 
So maybe we can add those to the Q&A for everybody to see, for the attendees to see. Welcome to part two of the Cultural Exchange and Creative Communities webinar organized by Fulbright Greece in partnership with the Santa Fe Art Institute. This is a recorded session and the recorded version will be made available on the Fulbright website. For those who just joined in, it's a pleasure to have you with us. We invite you to submit your questions through the Q&A function of your Zoom screen. We will then filter the questions and depending on the time available at the end of the second session, we will respond to some selected ones. Fulbright Greece Executive Director Artemis Zanetu will first address you with a few words of the Fulbright program to be followed by the Santa Fe Art Institute Executive Director Jamie Blosser and then Santa Fe Art Institute Residency Director Tony Gentili. Artemis, the stage is yours. Thank you, Alice. Welcome to the second part of our webinar. Fulbright Greece is one of the few Fulbright programs globally that has designed a scholarship program especially for artists. The scholarship program for artists is offered annually and targets professional artists in any field of the arts who wish to achieve a higher level of proficiency, engage in a US-Greece dialogue, seek advancement opportunities, and familiarize themselves with the US cultural scenes. Applicants include creative professionals in all artistic fields, including fine arts, creative writing, education, curatorship, art criticism, craft design, architecture, theater, cinematography, photography, and digital arts. In addition to the regular scholarship program for artists, in 2016, we're very pleased to partner with the Santa Fe Art Institute to award one scholarship annually to a Greek citizen for a semester long placement at Santa Fe thematic residency program. The Institute, in case you do not know, is located in the southwestern state of New Mexico, a stunning landscape, a rich local history, and diverse communities. The mission of the Institute aligns with the objectives of the Fulbright program to promote mutual understanding and improve intercultural relations, stressing the importance of connecting and building relationships and the need for critical public discourse exploring the power of arts to shape society and foster greater equity and inclusion. I'm very pleased to call now to present to us Jamie Blosser, Executive Director of Santa Fe. Jamie? Well done, Jamie will be right on. There she is, Jamie. Hello, can you see me? Yes, we can see you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and, and want to thank Els and, and Artemis. This has been a pleasure to plan this webinar with you. And it's been a really wonderful partnership for the last four or five years. I just want to make sure you can see my screen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. And um, you know, as as Lydia and and Lydia, thank you so much. What an amazing resource for so many artists and creative practitioners out there listening. I want to um, also support what what Lydia had said that a residency really um, really is an opportunity to learn about new places and cultures and to let that seep into your work. And so before I talk a little bit more about the Art Institute, I wanted to start with a land acknowledgement, which is what we do typically before at the beginning of each of our public programming events. Um, and it, it it's really something that is, um, our belief that acknowledging and reflecting upon the experiences, histories, and contemporary lives of the indigenous peoples 
here in New Mexico and around the world are essential steps toward creating a more equitable world. SFAI is located on unceded lands that are the traditional territories of Pueblo, Apache, and Southern Ute peoples, and have also long been home to the Diné or Navajo. The original Tewa name of Santa Fe is Ogapoge, which means white shell water place. We acknowledge the injustices and the enduring trauma that colonization of this land has imposed on indigenous peoples. We honor the sacrifices and invaluable contributions made by indigenous culture bearers who came before us and are here now. So I'm just, I'm not going to go into a great amount of detail, but uh, you know, we are one of the thematic residencies that um, Lydia spoke about and our flagship program at the Art Institute is our international thematic residency program of which the Fulbright Greece program is a wonderful partner in, in terms of providing additional support to Greek artists to participate with us in that thematic program. And our current theme of this year, sorry, should be 2021, <laughs> is our labor residency program, which of course, due to the pandemic, we have extended into 2021. And we have a lot of different artists, all of different disciplines. We are a very multidisciplinary program. And our typical residency is one to three months. And so the Greek Fulbright Fellowship is a three month uh, residency. We do not require outcomes, but we do ask for engagement with the theme. And we, uh, we really do prize and, and try to support a peer cohort to the extent possible. Um, many, as, as Lydia noted, there are many, many different types of residencies and ours is uh, unique in that it is a more uh, group experience. We have one building all with residential and studio space. And obviously this year with the uh, restrictions for health, we have had to modify that quite a bit. Um, but we're very much looking forward to welcoming residents back at the end of March. We also uh, host, connect our residents with the local community and now with virtual, more virtual programming, an even larger audience with uh, public programming. And so whether it's large or more intimate events, um, we offer space for that critical dialogue and exchange um, amongst the peer co cohort, but also with invited community members who may be content experts on the theme or activists or, or really grassroots organizers on a particular topic of the theme. And Tony, our residency director, works alongside with residents on what, what kind of opportunities they might want to experiment or to engage with the public. This has included uh, group exhibitions or small workshops with a, with a goal really to use the time at the Art Institute to experiment, to take some risks or to have some new steps you've been wanting to explore. And one of the new things that we've started this year to provide more support for our residents virtually and our alumni, but also to use uh, a podcast medium to explore uh, different topics and themes is our Tilt podcast. And, and this has been a very, something that we've been wanting to do for a while and with the need to develop more virtual programming and the desire to engage a broader audience, um, this has been a really interesting thing for us to produce a monthly podcast, the Tilt podcast. In addition to the residency program and the events that we host, we also host a local fellowship geared toward BIPOC local artists called the Story Maps Fellowship. And we hope to connect what we do with our alumni in particular, our amazing Greek alumni, many of whom you'll hear from today, and also alumni from Colombia with 
an opportunity for uh, our network to also see how the artists that we support and work with are working in their own local communities um, around social engaged projects. But Nutapan Ma, who is our strategic uh, initiatives coordinator, will provide more information on that um, in conversation with some of our alumni. And we aren't sure if or when we will be able to continue these, but we're hoping to. Just a little bit about our facilities. We're very fortunate to have these beautifully designed um, facilities. Ricardo Lagareta, who is a Mexican architect, built the design this in, in the late 90s. And it was one of the, the only uh, residency programs in the US at the time that was really designed for a residency program. And so we do have some nice courtyard spaces. Um, you can see that uh, the kitchen and lounge uh, really are that space for more informal interaction. There's a lot of activity that always happens around the dining table. Um, and we hope that next year in 2022 that we can lift some of the COVID restrictions to allow more of that to happen. We are being very, very safe this year. Um, so limiting some of that. Um, and also the gallery and studio space um, that's available. We do have semi-private studios and also opportunity for uh, the residents to, to use the gallery space. Sometimes it's just nice to see the work up on the walls um, or, or to, to really um, uh, invite others to participate in a performance or installation. And so, um, I kept this very brief because I know that we have a lot to share with you today, but I'm happy to answer any more specific questions when it's time for the Q&A. And I just invite everyone to also go to our website at sfai.org for more information. And so now I will turn it over to our residency director, Tony Gentili. She's going to talk more about the 2022 theme, which is revolution. Thank you, Tony. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for attending this um, talk today. Uh, I just wanted to dive a little bit more deeply into um, the Santa Fe Art Institute's thematic programming and um, the 2022 theme revolution specifically. Um, so, we really put together the theme on an annual basis to address pertinent questions that face um, diverse global communities as well as national and local communities here in northern New Mexico. And um, you know, provide a framework for a diverse group of artists to come together um, to have critical conversations um, around the theme and to hopefully foster mutual understanding. Um, and the way in which we pick the theme each year is just basically having conversations with our artists um, <clears throat> and looking at what they're exploring, exploring and experimenting with through their, their work, um, as well as, you know, what are some of the, the topics and stories and issues that are coming up um, in the news at the moment. And so <laughs> somehow we came up with um, through, you know, considering everything that was going on in the world, um, we came up with a theme of revolution. And that has um, really been spurred by, you know, a numerous global um, social movements and political protests that have been large scale and international in scope um, that have been occurring over the last several years and really, you know, um, addressing systemic violence and inequity um, through public discourse and um, protests. And so these upheavals, you know, have often been focused on wealth inequality and um, the ways in which it, it, it reinforces, you know, um, oppressive regimes, in, erodes democracy, public well being um, in various ways, and uh, global environmental stewardship. And so thinking back, you know, over the last decade, it's incredible to um, realize that uh, 2021 marks the 10 year anniversary of the Arab Spring um, and a year long wave of pro democracy uprisings um, against authoritarianism and throughout North Africa and the Middle East. And it was the same year that the 
Occupy movement began in New York City, um, and this was spurred by the bursting of the uh, US housing bubble and um, leading to the Great Recession. But it was incredible that this movement resonated on an international level and quickly spread to 951 cities and 82 countries across the world. So we are living in this increasingly globalized world. And um, according to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, since 2017, um, over the last little over three years, um, over 230 anti-government protests have erupted worldwide and um, more than 110 countries have experienced significant protests. Like considering, for example, what's happening now, um, the mass labor protests, um, that are being conducted by India's farmers um, or the protests around abortion legislation in Argentina and Poland, um, the anti-government protests that have been happening in Thailand and more recently the um, popular resistance to the military coup in Myanmar. And speaking from you know, the perspective of a uh, citizen of the United States of America, you know, our current system of government um, and social structures that support it um, continue to uphold, you know, these inequitable power dynamics and wealth disparities um, that a lot of other countries are experiencing. And I think the year 2020 really pushed our country over a precipice with um, widespread and sustained um, protests, uh, specifically around Black Lives Matter um, and that movement against uh, police violence and other systemic racial inequalities. Um, and all of these have been thrown into stark relief by the coronavirus pandemic, of course, and compounded by, you know, economic housing and healthcare crises. So this all um, led up to a really tumultuous uh, presidential election last fall. And, um, you know, the attack on the U.S. Capitol less than eight weeks ago. And so all of this is continuing to, you know, deeply affect um, our uh, current reality and politics, as well as our future as a democracy. And so, you know, just taking all these things into consideration, it seems really clear that our world is ripe for revolution on a number of different levels. Um, and while the many examples that I provided, you know, are marked by um, violence and um, loss of human life and, other great sacrifices, you know, it, it's possible to engender deep social and political change through um, enacting hope and immeasurable human potential and um, creativity and optimism. And so it's through these lenses that um, we will be engaging with our artists and creative practitioners um, in the 2022 theme of revolution. Um, so the, um, Basic questions that we proposed around um, the theme, you know, are asking how, how can our artists and creative practitioners reimagine the praxis, grammar, and aesthetics of entrenched and failing systems? How can we radically shift collective perceptions and lived reality to build capacity for self-determination of all peoples? And most importantly, what are the ways in which, um, you know, art and creative tactics can catalyze and support radical and profound social, political and environmental change that is sustained, intergenerational, inclusive and liberatory. So um, some of the artists that were selected for our forthcoming 22 Revolution residency include Anna Martine Whitehead, Elizabeth Burden and Veronica Jackson. Um, who through their interdisciplinary works involving choreography, performance, video, and sculpture, um, as well as textiles and immersive installations, um, they're creating pathways to Black liberation and exploring revolutionary concepts of uh, racial equity, um, prison abolitionism, and reparations. Um, there's also the photographer M. Sharkey and painter Lauren Buckness and musician Molly Joyce, each of whom are addressing identity as it relates to embodied experience. Um, and they're creatively encouraging a revolution against um, narrow gender norms and body standards by celebrating the diversity and re resilience and complexity of the LGBTQ community. Um, looking into um, the positive aspects of um, fat activism and body positivity and, um, you know, really viewing disability as a natural part of the human spectrum. 
Um, so you can see sort of the diversity of the disciplines and topics uh, that these artists are using to engage with the broader theme of revolution. Um, and all of these incredible American artists will be working alongside um, other artists coming from across the globe, uh, addressing revolutionary issues and ideas specific to some of the many cultures of Mexico, Guatemala, Colombia. Um, we have folks coming from Argentina, Spain, uh, Haiti, Jamaica, Egypt, um, Iran, China, and South Korea. Um, so really at the core of uh, every residency at the Santa Fe Art Institute is this intercultural exchange among our residents and um, the critical and experimental employment of creativity in confronting injustice um, to hopefully uh, inspire the transformation of societies for the betterment of all peoples. Um, and SFAI is uh, extremely honored, of course, to include a graceful bright fellow in our annual cohort. Um, and so with that, I just want to say thank you and um, offer the opportunity to answer any questions you may have of me at the end of this session. And it is a pleasure to introduce our main speaker for this evening, Maria Yorgopoulou, director of the Gennadius Library of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens and a Fulbright alumna. Dr. Maria Yorgopoulou was educated at the University of Athens, the Sorbonne, and the University of California, Los Angeles. She taught art history at Yale University, where she also founded the Program for Hellenic Studies. Dr. Yorgopoulou will speak about the timely subject of revolution, the title of her presentation, The Free and the Brave, Ideas and Ideals of Revolution in View of the Greek War of Independence and American Philalesmins. Dr. Yoropoulou. Uh, hello. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to share my screen. Mm -hmm. We can see you and we can see your screen. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you very much uh, for allowing me to join in this uh, very interesting conversation. Uh, so uh, as it turns out, 1821 marks the bicentennial of the Greek War of Independence, a war referred to in Greek as revolution an uprising against uh, Ottoman rule that uh, had lasted for almost 400 years. In less than 10 years since its beginning, the Greek revolution resulted uh, in the creation of the modern Greek state. Obviously this 200 year anniversary is a big deal for Greece and uh, it offers the opportunity to reflect on identity, origins, but most importantly in the context of our gathering on the very concept of revolution. I have the privilege to be in charge of a very important rare book library uh, in Athens uh, that houses great treasures on the history of Greece. And I'm showing an image of the Yanarius Library taken uh, last week. Uh, and uh, I, you, can, you, you know that this is not the typical way the library looks, but I wanted to share this snowy feeling uh, that uh, we rarely get in Athens. The library was housed to, uh, was, was founded to house the collection of the Greek ambassador, uh, John Yanavius, who offered uh, his uh, books uh, to the American School of Classical Studies at Athens in 1922. You would know already, since I'm a full writer, that I'm a strong believer in exploring collection, connections and collections. So to celebrate the convergence of our two countries, Greece and the United States, we're organizing in this year in 2021, an exhibition on American Philhellenism. This is a movement that brought young Americans to fight in Greece and American humanitarian aid to Greece for the first time on the outbreak of the Greek revolution. Americans at home, helped to arouse public sentiment and sympathy in favor of Greece, raised money and provisions to aid the cause and lobbied their representatives to recognize Hellenic independence, while missionaries came to Greece to establish schools. 
As I'm putting together the final brush strokes uh, for the introduction to the exhibition catalog, today I will share some thoughts that I hope will resonate with the project that some of you will embark on when thinking about the topic of revolution for the Santa Fe Institute residency. So to get us started, what is the meaning of revolution? The etymology of the term in Greek and English shows an impressive difference between movement in English and stasis in Greek. The noun revolution originally refers to celestial bodies from Old French and Latin. The revolution referred to the coarse revolution of celestial bodies, a revolving. This leads then to the general sense of instance uh, of great change in affairs, and eventually by the 17th century, the term acquires a political meaning, the one that uh, we now use. In Greek, the term revolution, epanastasi, comes from the ancient Greek verb to stand up against, to rise up against. So it is more akin to the term insurrection, which in Greece also has a relationship with resurrection. So we can think of revolution as fighting, standing up against, or protesting against, but also we can think of the result of revolution, which is social and political change. In other words, a move from one situation to another. So revolution brings to our minds, on the one hand, war, battle, bloodshed, protest, even death, and on the other hand, some peaceful outcomes and change uh, that come after the successful, successful conclusion of revolution. So to get to our historical uh, topic here, the Greek revolution and uh, the American response to it, um, I want to remind you that uh, in 1821 or a little bit before, uh, the uh, international um, policy uh, was one of uh, neutrality, both in Europe with the Holy Alliance, uh, but also in America through the Monroe Doctrine uh, that uh, was passed on December 1823. So the people who actually came from America to Greece to help the revolution uh, were individuals. And our exhibition uh, named The Free and the Brave really focuses on the lives, on the actions of these individuals uh, who uh, in fact came to Greece to help Greeks fight against the Ottoman Turks. Uh, and uh, we explore the, the, um, uh, the, the power that this revolution had on the American psyche. So these individual actors were inspired by ideals and slogans uh, that were translated uh, from ancient Greece to the US and vice versa. And these individuals uh, acted as orators and writers, as fighters and political representatives, as educators and missionaries, as artists and abolitionists. And of course, they formed formal and informal networks. Phil Hellings sought to convince the American public that Greece as the birthplace of Western civilization deserved to be resurrected as a free and democratic, democratic state. And you read on the left, uh, the, uh, some of the words uh, of President James Monroe. The American Revolution of 1776, which in itself had been based on Greco-Roman ideals of democracy and Republican life, was an inspiration for the enslaved Greeks to fight for their liberation. What was the strategy of the Greeks? On May 1821, Petros Mavromichalis sent a letter to the then Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams. He appealed to the citizens of America, not to the state, but to the citizens of America to help the Greeks purge Greece from the barbarians. And Mavromichalis kindly invoked uh, the affinity of American and ancient Greek liberty. He says, it is in your land that liberty has fixed her abode, and by you that she is prized, as by our fathers. Soon, a small embassy was sent by the revolutionaries to Paris, uh, where its members consulted uh, an important Greek scholar, Korais. Korais had been an interlocutor with Thomas, of, uh, Thomas Jefferson, and uh, the, the 
point of the revolutionaries uh, was how to spread the word uh, to America. At, and at this point, something extraordinarily happened uh, that showcases uh, the revolutionary significance of education. Corais chose an American, Edward Everett, who was a classicist at Harvard, and he would be the key figure to promote the cause of the Greeks in America. Everett had been appointed as the first Eliot professor of Greek at Harvard at the young age of 21 and managed to have a leave of four years to travel in Europe and Greece uh, in order where he learned uh, modern Greek. And in Paris, he met uh, Corais. He managed to uh, hold uh, 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 important uh, political offices. And at the time of the Greek Revolution, he was editor of a very influential um, uh, periodical uh, in the US, the North American Review, where he publicized the Greek Proclamation of Independence. He also urged uh, his friends uh, to uh, lobby about the Greek cause, and one of them uh, was uh, Daniel Webster, a US congressman, who in January 1823 delivered a famous Greek speech from the floor of the House of Representatives. He began by invoking the legacy of Greek antiquity, as you can read, this free form of government, this popular assembly held for the common good. Where have we contemplated its earliest models? And yet he insisted uh, that the whole point was not to think about uh, ancient Greece, but uh, to think about the modern, the living and not the dead. So it is the present that takes precedence, the fight. So key to all this is of course, the dissemination of all this material through uh, the uh, press, uh, which at this time uh, it was distributed more quickly and more broadly. This is to tie with uh, the sense of global um, uh, information. And it is thanks uh, to this press that the cruelty of the war, especially the massacre of Hios and the death of Lord, Lord Byron in Mesolonghi inspired many young Americans to join the Greek revolutionaries. The motto of the revolutionaries, freedom or death, would amply resonate with Americans. After all, it reflected the famous saying, give me liberty or give me death, attributed to Patrick Henry at the Second Virginia Convention of 1775. It spoke directly to the heart of the Americans and it had immediate appeal to, young, to the young Americans. The first to join the cause in 1822 was the New Yorker, George Jarvis, whose journal you see on the left, who became Lieutenant General in the Greek forces, learned Greek, and his journal is written in Greek, and became known as Kapitan Zervos. Uh, the name uh, is, is what, what you hear it uh, close to Jarvis. In, this, uh, in his regiment, he was joined by Jonathan P. Miller of Vermont and a third very famous uh, American Philhelen, Philhelen uh, is uh, Samuel Gridley Howe that you see in the center, a Bostonian physician from Harvard who came to Greece after his graduation in 1824. And he served both as a soldier, but as a chief surgeon. In 1827, uh, all three men uh, were actually joined, uh, joined in Greece uh, in order to help uh, the distribution of uh, the important humanitarian aid uh, that uh, Americans uh, had collected at home through balls, theatrical plays, fundraising, and this amounted to about $75,000 uh, in 1827, 28, that came to Greece in, in six uh, vessels. Samuel Gridley Howe even managed to establish uh, a model uh, village uh, for refugees uh, near Corinth, uh, which uh, was known as uh, Washingtonia. And after the Greek uh, War of Independence, uh, Howe returned to Boston, uh, where he became uh, head uh, of uh, the Perkins School of the Blind and eventually an abolitionist. Not only did this uh, Phil Hellings uh, participate uh, in relief efforts and aid, 
Uh, but they also brought back home uh, several Greek orphans to the US. Many of the children were educated uh, in colleges uh, in New England and pursued important careers in the army, in diplomacy, in education and politics uh, in the US or returned to Greece. And on the right, you see one of these orphans in quotation marks, uh, Christophoros Castanis, who has written his biography from which we uh, learn that one of his ways uh, in which he was making a living was to go around uh, the US give, giving lectures about uh, his plight uh, during uh, the Greek Revolution. And uh, he's dressed uh, in uh, his fustanella, and uh, this actually uh, really makes uh, all these Philhellens, uh, including the founder of, uh, of uh, the library uh, that uh, I direct, uh, to uh, actually show themselves uh, as uh, very closely related uh, to the Greek fighters of 1821. Of major significance though, uh, as, as uh, I, is also the, the residue of uh, revolution, of these contacts that were initiated by revolution. The American churches at the time gave ser serious thought to preaching the gospel to uh, the Ottoman Empire and Greece. Uh, and the missionaries um, were not that successful in proselytizing, but uh, they were very crucial uh, in uh, starting schools and providing much uh, needed uh, textbooks. And in fact, one of these uh, schools uh, that was established in Athens uh, by uh, Reverend John J. Hill and his wife Frances is still um, uh, a, a very good school that functions still today. Uh, and uh, also there, were, there was an operation of uh, a school for educating teachers uh, on the principles of the Troy Institute of Emma Willard. All these very important and well-known figures uh, in the US. On the other hand, some of the Greeks who came to the States as uh, orphans or by other means uh, became uh, educators uh, like uh, Alexander Negris, uh, who was a veteran of the War of Independence, uh, or uh, uh, Evangelinos Apostolidis Sophocles, who was brought to America by missionaries and uh, taught uh, medieval and modern Greek at Harvard. Finally, and uh, this uh, gets back to uh, the idea of revolution, uh, as the revolution coming uh, back uh, and uh, um, uh, revolution can breed more revolutions. Uh, it was the uh, uh, intellectual other, um, underpinnings of revolutionary discourse that was appropriated uh, from uh, the, uh, the, the, the plight uh, of uh, the, the slaves, uh, to, of the Greek slaves to the Ottomans uh, to, um, and was appropriated uh, in the ideas uh, of abolitionism. Um, what is interesting is that the first constitution of Greece, uh, the constitution of 1822, which was modeled after the American constitution, uh, proclaimed the abolition of slavery in Greece. And it was black observers in the US uh, in the 1820s uh, that first began linking the Greek revolution to American slavery. And uh, this, uh, uh, this version of this black version of uh, Philhellenism uh, is uh, quite important and we're exploring uh, in, in our exhibition. Yet uh, for uh, some uh, African-American and white abolitionists, the Ottoman political uh, oppression of the Greeks and the sale of Greek women and children into slavery paled in comparison to the horrors of slavery in the American South. Uh, similar criticisms of racism and hypocrisy were raised at the ecstatic reception of uh, this uh, particular uh, statue that you see on the left, uh, the statue of the Greek slave uh, by Hiram Powers. Uh, Powers uh, uh, lived, uh, was from uh, Cincinnati, grew up in Ohio and Cincinnati, but spent most of his life in Florence uh, where he uh, carved uh, statue, statuary in marble. Uh, this uh, this uh, statue is uh, the first uh, nude to uh, come to America in uh, the 1840s. 
Uh, and the Greek slave uh, was paraded uh, in, in many uh, exhibition spaces in the US uh, and uh, uh, actually um, uh, Hiram Pow Powers managed to uh, become uh, an international star uh, because uh, of this uh, statue. And he justified the nudity of the statue uh, by the story of the woman. She was a Greek woman captured by Ottoman uh, forces during the War of Independence. And uh, she had been stripped and chained for sale at the slave market in Constantinople. And her nudity uh, is, was actually had to do with the purity of this uh, young uh, woman. But as you see, uh, it was uh, a statue that uh, in some instances, uh, it was um, actually um, seen, uh, viewed sarcastically uh, in, in order to really make this comparison and underline the fact uh, that slavery was not just uh, an issue uh, with uh, uh, sort of that, that had to do with the, the Ottoman uh, uh, slaves uh, or the slaves taken by the Ottomans, but also uh, by, uh, but, but it had to be thought of in terms of American abolitionism. The Greek slave uh, was exhibited uh, at the Great Exhibition uh, in Crystal Palace in 1851 in London, uh, where uh, it was uh, admired uh, as a symbol of America by uh, about 6 million people. Uh, and uh, it was the first time that the United States had participated in an international exhibition. And not far away from there was the Greek pavilion, the first Greek pavilion as well, where the only uh, exhibit uh, under two huge flags uh, was a Greek wearing a fustanella. So, however, we decide to wrap our head around the term revolution, to stand in battle, to transmit slogans of freedom or change or protest, to educate, to offer aid to refugees or fighters, to seek a new unimaginable unima world, to keep, uh, we have to keep in mind that art has tremendous revolutionary power to change the world, to create connections, to translate feelings and wishes into something palpable, beautiful, strong, and significant for all of us. I wish you luck with your creative thinking about revolution and rem remember that at this moment of doom, I mean the pandemic, uh, we need all of you artists to teach us how to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yorgopoulou, for a very engaging presentation. And I think we're all ready and looking forward to the exhibition you're going to be curating. Hopefully, circumstances will allow that. Thank you. And now we're moving to the last section of the webinar, Cultural Exchange and Creative Communities. The partnership between Fulbright and the Santa Fe Art Institute led to further cultural exchanges between the two countries such as a social impact trip, which we hope it will soon materialize, and also to creating a wonderful small community of alumni fellows from Fulbright and Santa Fe. This uh, section uh, will be uh, led by Natapo Ma from the Art Institute, and we will also hear from Fulbright alumni fellows, Daphne Calafati, Alex Simopoulos, and Andromachi Papayoano. We look forward to hearing from you. Hello everyone, welcome um, to potential um, applicants. This is the fun part. We get to share our work and share our stories. Um, I'm here with Daphne, Alex, and Andromachi will be joining. Hello, Andromachi. It's so great to see everybody. We're going to get started right away with um, just stories and experiences uh, from Daphne, Alex, and Andromachi um, to give you a glimpse of what SFAI Fulbright Fellows are doing at, and have done at SFAI. And I will conclude um, with some stories as I always do. Um, I believe in storytelling and that's a way to reach and connect to the hearts of people. And unfortunately with this uh, Zoom technology, it's 
it's what we have, you know? Um, so I, I hope in some way, though I don't see you in the audience that uh, all four, four, all four, um, four of us um, have touched you in some way and uh, good luck with your applications. I don't know when the details are when to apply, but I think you have a lot of um, foundational information um, here. And lastly, I would like to thank Els and Artemis from Grace Fulbright for inviting us um, to this panel, to this webinar and providing a platform for us to share our stories with you. So take it away, Daphne, and tell me to move the slides. Okay, uh, hello everybody. I don't know if you can see me. Can you see me? I don't know where is the video, uh, my video. We can see all of you, yes. Ah, okay, great. Okay, so um, my name is Daphne and I'm an art therapist and photographer. And first of all, I want to thank everybody that spoke before me. And um, I kind of have the inspiration now to apply for a new residency. Uh, the reason why I'm speaking first is because I was the first um, Greek Fulbright Fellow and uh, to go to the SFAI. And that was an honor and a challenge at the same time for me. And of course, uh, landing in New Mexico, as you can see in the picture, this is a, a photograph of the Rio Grande uh, that I took during my residency there. So landing in New Mexico and in the SFAI was a mind opening experience and it was a, a very unique uh, opportunity. So we can get to the, to the next slide, Natapon. Okay, yes. So here you can see some um, uh, pictures like memories from uh, our work with the fellow residents in the SFAI. Uh, through this art residency, uh, I got the opportunity to come in contact with an unknown culture, first of all, like the US culture. And uh, I connected with an amazing network of artists coming from all over the world, which this network, the good news is that it's still active. So many of us are still in contact and we've also uh, proceed to many creative collaborations and online talks and maybe physical exhibitions in the future. And uh, as a professional while in the SFI, I of course improved my communication and problem solving skills because uh, we had to uh, give answers to many challenges and think of ways to present our work and uh, participate in all this creative atmosphere that was there. We can see the next slide now. It's still, um, this is the, the working space. So I would also like to say, I don't know who is listening. If anybody of you is planning to apply for the SFI residency, I would um, totally uh, suggest you to do so. So this is a, you can see our working space. So this is the studio we, uh, every resident had and every resident had the space to make his own little house inside the studio. And actually it was a house because you just sleep there, eat there and spend a lot of time working. Um, and it was like a creative refuge for me. And um, many ideas I'm still working on today uh, were conceived in this little space. Uh, when I, my actual project, when I went there, and my before go interest for the US um, was around the native culture. This is why I chose to apply for the residency because I really uh, felt identified with the theme, the equal justice theme. That was the theme of the first residency back in 2018, I think it was 18. So, uh, I'm very interested in native cultures around the world. And um, um, knowing also that Santa Fe, as also Jamie said, it's, a, it's on a native lands and there is a big population of native tribes and pueblos and reservation all around it. I thought it was a, it was a great opportunity for me um, to connect with all these um, 
all these words, no, in a way. So we can get to the new slide, to the next slide. So yes, after some talks, actually a lot of talks, a lot of meetings, and a lot of um, journeys and in the broader New Mexico area and a lot of wandering and stuff, I created the Buffalo Firewoman project. This is the logo of the project that Alex has designed, which is the resident you're gonna hear of, um, of him next, the next resident DSFI. So I created the Buffalo Firewoman project, which was and is, because it's still an ongoing thing and that's the good news also, a participatory photography um, project specially designed for native women. Uh, so I traveled extensively in the broader New Mexico area, visiting native pueblos and working with my characters. Those are the women you can see my, were my students. Uh, women coming from different, uh, the different pueblos around uh, Santa Fe. I was teaching them photography and uh, my goal was to enable them to express themselves through visual language. Uh, and that was because this is how I, I express and the theme of the residency that was equal justice. And I really and strongly believe that those women, even more for the conditions they are living and for being native, they are not discriminated only as women, but also as native um, people in the US. So I wanted to fight against this and justice in a way and um, help them to raise their voice and kind of um, come in, uh, in peace with their, their feelings and stuff. Um, after I finished my residency, I think we have one more slide no, to show from the project. Not so we can, yes. So here you can see a bit the work in progress and all the workshops we, I was doing and in the meetings with the women. So the, um, the Buffalo Fire Woman project, after I finished my residency, it was presented in Greece and now it transformed on an online exhibition. And um, I'm still in contact with all the participants and we are also planning to make some more things together. I know it, it was a very difficult and challenging time this last year with the coronavirus and everything but um, we are still um, dreaming and imagining to do a physical exhibition in um, Santa Fe. Maybe it happens once. So after I finished my residency, uh, which I feel that it was never finished, I, came, I went back to New Mexico one more time because I, I couldn't finish in the three months the project with the women in the three, four months the residency lasted. So I went back to continue working with, um, with the women, even though my residency was um, finished. And here I'm going to do a parenthesis. It would be nice for everybody who are doing a, a short term residency to be a bit more organized than me so they don't end up going back again as I did, though it was very nice. So I went back to continue and complete the work I started. And um, what happened when I went back is that I met Alex, the new resident. And um, it was a good opportunity that we got the space and the time to reflect on some issues that they were related with us being the Fulbright Fellows in the context of SFAI and how, how we could uh, further, um, in a way, um, get advantage of our opportunity to be there in order to foster the relationships between Greece and the US. And together with Alex and Natapon, uh, we had some uh, kind of uh, ideas that when we had them, they were more like uh, dreams, but now they are close, a step closer to reality. Um, on how we could use the opportunity of the residency to involve uh, more people and bring the two cultures together, like the US and the Greek culture, through the arts and through different um, social actions. Uh, 
So Alex and Atapon are going to talk more about what happened next in our ideas. Um, I just want to stress out one more time how um, what an amazing uh, time and opportunity it was and thank the Fulbright Institute and thank the SFI and um, um, yes, I don't know, I'm gonna be here until the end if anybody wants to ask something more, but yes, I'm gonna stop now to leave some space and time for the, my fellow residents to talk. Okay, uh, it's my turn, I guess. Um, uh, hi everyone, um, I hope you're well, happy, safe during these uh, weird times. Uh, thanks a lot to Fulbright and SFAI for organizing this. And thanks to all the previous uh, panelists. Um, my name is Alexandros Simopoulos and uh, I am a visual artist from uh, Athens, Greece. And during the past, I would say four or five years, I have participated in many different residency programs internationally in different countries and in completely different contexts, uh, from Italy to Greenland to Malta to Germany. And to be honest, I'm even in a residency right now, as we speak. And uh, uh, in a way, residencies are interesting and important for me, mostly for two reasons that overlap. Um, the first one is that they enable you to travel and to, to explore new territories and they make you think about your work uh, in new contexts. And the second one is that they help you foster connections in a way and create, build uh, relationships with other artists and other cultural professionals as well uh, that come from uh, a totally different place than you. And uh, for me, this is really interesting because a big part of my work has to do with the public space and uh, with collaborating or working with different people from different communities and different backgrounds. Uh, in that way, I'm interested in making work that can be communicated also outside of the art world and outside of the traditional uh, institution or gallery setting. And uh, I had the pleasure and the privilege to be a Fulbright Fellow artist at the SFAI in uh, 2019, after Daphne. And uh, uh, I had a great time. And to be honest, I think that SFAI has been one of the most interesting uh, residency programs I have ever participated. Uh, and that was has to do with uh, the staff uh, making sure to establish a safe space for everyone involved in the residency. But also it has to do with them like encouraging a critical dialogue and fostering connections between the participants, uh, which I consider really important. Uh, the, like uh, the multidisciplinary background of the participants made this even more interesting. And in a way, like the whole uh, vibe of the residency was that people were very uh, willing to exchange, to discuss, to, to talk about their work and not just locked in their own uh, studio world. Um, also for me, like uh, it's really important the locality of the residency. So. Santa Fe, New Mexico have been a revelation. Uh, they were far different than what I expected. And uh, New Mexico is a very beautiful place and weird in a way because it is rural and secluded, but also it's super rich regarding its history, communities, landscape, food, culture. And I think that as everyone has said before me, Daphne and Tony and Jamie as well. One of the most important reasons for this, I, I believe, is that it consists mostly of indigenous lands. And there is uh, still a very strong presence of indigenous population, culture and tradition. Also, another very important aspect of the locality of New Mexico is that it's situated so close to the US borders with Mexico and uh, there is a strong uh, Mexican and Chicanx cultural influence as well. 
And all this means, of course, that it's a place with so many diverse histories that interconnect, but also class with each other. So there are many contested histories surrounding uh, the place. And there is trauma, of course. Uh, I was a resident during the Truth and Reconciliation theme. And uh, my, inter my interest was how, how does, does this theme manifest on the public space in New Mexico and how can, could I connect it to the public space? Uh, and the answer came actually to the local, to members that I met in the local creative uh, community, which was one of the best parts of my residency. So I was really excited to find so many artists especially in such a small place. Most of them were indigenous, but most of them also, like we shared a lot of uh, common interests and a similar background because they were also really invested in public space. And even, even though they were weaving like their uh, own uh, personal histories and the history of their communities in, the, in their practice, which I find very interesting. And uh, I was very fascinated by how much like uh, their communities welcomed me as well. So we formed uh, connections with many of these artists and we're friends. And because of that, um, I decided to invite them uh, to collaborate with me. So instead of doing, a, in a way, a, a project just by myself, um, I wanted to, to invite the people and the artists that I met. Um, uh, and I think that this is very important for me, especially when working uh, in public spaces in contexts that I'm not uh, familiar with. For me, it's very important to share space with the people that are already there and live there. So we presented a um, participatory installation slash exhibition at the Gallery of SFAI. The name was Boundary Drawing. And uh, in a way, it was like an experimental design lab for murals or public monuments that invited uh, um, local artists, as well as the public to respond to surfaces of tension, to question, question monuments, and to imagine new narratives about specific uh, locations on the public space of New Mexico. Um, visitors were invited as well to respond uh, to to these specific spaces by sketching a proposal for their own monuments or uh, sketching possible interventions in uh, existing monuments. And the responses were instantly included in the exhibition and documented. And uh, for me, it's very interesting in a way, or quite um, surprise, maybe not a huge surprise, but quite surprising that all this discussion surrounding monuments uh, that was happening at the time, materialized quite heavily in different forms last year. And it was quite uh, crazy to see that some months ago, uh, in October uh, 2020, if I'm not mistaken, uh, one of the monuments in question at the exhibition uh, no longer exists because it was uh, removed by the people of uh, Santa Fe in New Mexico. Um, so, in a way, it was a great uh, experience and uh, coming back, I think I'm mostly uh, happy for the connections I built with people and the people and the other artists I met. And two of them are actually Daphne and Natapon. And uh, it's very interesting to see also that through this experience, I have already collaborated with Daphne in quite a few projects in Greece. And now, together with Natapon, but he's going to say more about it, we are going to collaborate on a new one. So that's it. Thank you. And uh, Andromachi is going to talk to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, hi, everyone. I hope you can uh, hear me. Uh, my name is Andromachi, and before I start, I would really like to thank uh, both uh, Fulbright and SFA for this opportunity uh, to participate in this webinar, but, most, uh, but mostly about the opportunity to travel 
to New Mexico and be a Fulbright Fellow and live this amazing experience of uh, those uh, three months in, um, in Santa Fe. I think it was, um, it was the first residency I ever did. Uh, I'm a social anthropologist and, um, and a visual storyteller. And I work mainly with migrants and refugees uh, and collect stories and try to uh, make them more uh, visible um, uh, in the public in order uh, to highlight that being a migrant or a refugee is something that uh, can happen to any of us or has already happened to many of us. Um, so, uh, drawing from my refugee uh, background, uh, what I did in, um, in SFAI those uh, three months uh, was that um, uh, it gave me the opportunity to explore different uh, aspects of my creative uh, um, practice. And it was the first time I think in my life that I have the space and the time to think uh, and explore and challenge uh, myself and uh, experiment with different forms of art that I had never done before. So. Uh, while I was in Santa Fe, I experimented with poetry, which was the first time that I ever did in my life. And I felt so safe in SFAI that I, I could um, write my words on the wall and uh, feel that I could um, show them uh, in public. I drew uh, initially inspiration from stories inside my own family. Uh, and then I conducted interviews with migrants and uh, refugees in, uh, in the broader area of New Mexico. And I transformed those uh, stories into poetry. Unfortunately, COVID-19 reached the uh, uh, US quite early. So um, we, I was fortunate and unfortunate at the same time because we, uh, I had the opportunity to fully leave the residency for the first two months, while the third one we were on quarantine and we had to leave the US earlier um, because borders were closing. Uh, so um, my, project, my project wasn't uh, finished and it wasn't presented the way I wanted to be, it to be presented in Santa Fe, but now, uh, but I think um, I keep working on it and uh, I'm pretty sure that quite soon I will be able to present it at least uh, uh, in Greece. Um, I think the most important thing about uh, being uh, um, at the SFAI was the opportunity to meet people from uh, various places and uh, have discussions, challenge each other, um, exchange opinions about various um, issues, eat together, which was, I think, uh, uh, like on this table, we had the best conversations ever. And especially the last uh, month, because we were in quarantine and we were spending almost all our days insta inside uh, SFAI without being able to go out much, uh, we really had the opportunity to get to know each other and uh, and become real, become friends, which was important. And uh, we, we, I still keep uh, contact with most of my um, fellow residents at that time. And um, even though, um, let's say, uh, artistically, the last month was a bit uh, heavy uh, because there was fear, there was anxiety, so there was not much space to uh, and to create. On the other hand, there was uh, lots of willingness to open up and share things with each other. And I think this was also something that uh, uh, was very, very uh, important. I really, I would really, I don't know if in the audience are people who are interested to apply in the next, um, for the next theme, the revolution, uh, but I would really encourage uh, all of them to do so because it's an amazing uh, place, New Mexico, and SFAI is also an institution that will give you the time and the space and uh, the liberty to 
work on your practice in a really, really safe environment and also give you the opportunity to meet uh, amazing people from around the world. That's it from me. And Thank you all so much. I'm giving uh, the floor to Natapol. Thank you, Andromachi. Now I'm the slide DJ for my own slide. Welcome everybody and thank you for sticking around um, for the last bit. I guess I am um, the last person to speak. Um, so hello again, um, my name is Natapon. Um, I am a visual artist and currently based in Northern um, New Mexico. Um, over the years since 2016, I've carried multiple roles at SFAI, um, starting off as an artist in resident under the immigration, emigration thematic residency. And I've, I've typed up all the different themes over the years uh, in the slides that you can see uh, along the, the middle wall. Um, that's me in the studio space. Um, and then I, I've since then returned as an alumni fellow the following year, and now I'm full-time staff at SFAI. Um, a little bit about my role here, um, I, I currently support SFAI new and existing programs, some of which brings, brings me back to connection with our past resident, three of whom you have met in this presentation. Um, I've included this image of SFAI studio space just to give you a spatial connection to SFAI. Um, you know, prior to arriving to SFAI for the very first time, I've, I, and I, I'm sure a lot of you can relate, um, you know, I've worked in tiny places such as on the back of my pickup truck um, in my tiny so, uh, small studio apartment in Los Angeles. And when I arrived um, at SFAI as an artist in resident, I thought I checked into a five-star hotel. It was amazing. Um, but, you know, needless to say, having that space helps. But really, and I think Andromahi, Daphne, and Alex can attest to this, it's really the people that makes this place, uh, this place special. The conversation and exchanges happen here throughout the day and into the night. Um, and in this studio space, I love it um, in the late evenings or late afternoon when I was in resident. It's just buzzing with, with energy and um, our collective marks have made an imprint um, to that energy in this space. And, I, and that's, that's why I wanted to share this image with you. Um, as I, right now it's, it's sitting empty. And as Jamie has said that it's, um, we're getting ready to, to reopen and welcome artists um, end of March and I'm super duper excited. And the other day I walked through the space and I, I, can, I can still pinpoint exactly where Alex, um, you know, uh, Alex in, uh, left his invisible ink that he tagged onto the wall. Um, I can still, when I walk past Andra Mahi, I can still visualize and imagine her uh, wall poetry, especially um, the one about the lemon tree at the uh, at, at her grandmother's house. Um, and lastly, you know, um, when it was sitting empty, being a visual artist myself, I kind of moved in and started to work in there. And I, I took up Daphne's space and I, I can still imagine her participatory installation in that space. So um, Daphne, Alex, Andromahi, you've left a, a very um, important mark here. And I look forward to meet future Fulbright Fellows to activate the space. Um, next slide. I know um, <laughs> this image will probably very, be very familiar um, uh, on social media, um, though it's, it's familiar. Um, and it's this, the same people at uh, the same table, but the people, uh, just different group of people um, here in this image that uh, is similar to what Andromahi has shared. But I assured you that the conversation are just as rich. Um, and why is this so important, important for me to begin to talk about um, these continued uh, exchanges? Um, with past and future um, Greek Fulbright Fellows at SFAI. Well, for me, this image talks a lot about food and community. Um, it is really through these informal gathering that we begin to build trust 
and lifelong friendships to further unpack um, social issues that, that we as contemporary artists are invested in. And really a, a little side note about this image, um, it was taken uh, in March, 2018. You can see Daphne on the side way in the back and myself uh, also on the, on the, sorry, Daphne on the left and I myself on the right way in the back. But uh, we gathered here and it, this, this particular image or the series of food gathering was really special in a way that um, we, we, we didn't know this of the food that's presented on this table, but the backstory was really, we secretly called our, our moms to get um, recipes to, to um, present some of these dishes. Um, one of which, uh, um, Kate, who is here, she's Greek American. And I remember she called her mother to, to ask her mom how to make baklava and we jokingly uh, and Daphne, you can attest to this. I'm, I'm sure you remember the taste of that baklava. We jokingly told Kate that, um, you know, she's she succeeded to finding a a, 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 a Greek husband now with that baklava. Um, and I, I have to admit that having been an alumni fellow and, and staying at SFAI for a really uh, longer extended period of time, it was difficult for me to say goodbye after sharing such rich experience together with uh, that we that we flur uh, left with we were left with a yearning to continue with more exchanges, and having. Um, and I had to say many um, difficult goodbyes um, along the way. And as Andra Mahi have, have uh, and Daphne and Alex have, have attest to, uh, we've kept in touch over the years informally via WhatsApp, email, social media, but it was not until fall of 2019 did we start to talk about how SFAI can connect with past residents. And that's when I began a, a more quote unquote formal conversation with Daphne and Alex and how we can carry this energy that you see here in the dining table, the informal conversations um, um, to critically broaden um, our, our conversation. How can we do that? So the very first question I asked Alex and Daphne, and you know, unfortunately at that time, Andra Mahi has not started her, her fellowship at SFAI was really, um, I'd asked Daphne and Alex to begin uh, framing uh, our, the SFA, SFAI alumni trips is, um, you know, if you were to invite people to your home, what will you share? Uh, meaning that if we were to take SFAI's community from Northern New Mexico to Greece, how can we make this a socially impactful experience? Our exchanges grew, uh, drew more, uh, drew from com comparative learnings. Um, another question we'd ask in constructing the framework for such trip is, what were some overlapping themes um, that Daphne and Alex um, have taken note whilst they were in residence at SFAI to that in Greece. Um, in the end, our aspiration for SFAI's uh, alumni trip is to meaningfully continue our partnership and exchanges with past resident, resulting in a curated, intimate and engaging experience that not only highlights the impact of art on society, but also reflect how SFAI's annual themes traverse beyond the United States. Um, I'm, I'm gonna leave, I know, um, you know, our section um, have extended way beyond the allocated time of 15 minutes. So I do apologize uh, for that, but I hope the four of us have, uh, have been able to paint the picture uh, of, of the experience here at the Santa Fe Art Institute. And, and, and I hope um, with this last slide, I'm, I was able to plant the seed of how we can continue to, to expand upon the critical dialogues that we, that, that we had started at the dining table and, and, and travel um, to other places. Um, Janie had mentioned Greece and Colombia. So, before COVID um, pandemic had, um, had really taken its hold, 
um, er, uh, around mid-March in the United States, we were in the plans of, of activating these alumni trips to both Greece and Colombia. So I look forward to, um, um, to continue to work with um, our alumni and, and, and travel to different places. It's kind of like SFAI's thematic re residency on the road in a way, and the dining table is traveling from SFAI to other places, to other countries. So I thank you for your time, and I'll return this um, floor back to Els and Artemis um, uh, for any questions mm -hmm. that the audience may have. Okay, uh, thank you, first of all, Nutapal, uh, Daphne, Alex, and Andromaki for your contributions. You are the ones with the immediate experience with residencies, so we loved hearing about this. Um, our special thanks also goes to our distinguished speaker, uh, Maria Yorgopoulou, uh, who was in part two. And uh, we definitely urge you to look into the upcoming Gennadius Library exhibition on the free and the brave. Uh, we've indeed run a little late. We're all together now on the gallery view so that we can uh, say our goodbyes. We don't have any immediate questions, but I would like to ask Maria maybe about the exhibition um, to tell us about the format and the dates to inform both us and the Yes, attendees. well, uh, there will be an exhibition, a real exhibition physically uh, at uh, the Yanadios Library from May 25th to December 19th. Uh, but of course, the exhibition will also be online. Uh, so I hope we will have a chance to communicate either physically or virtually. Uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we will also, uh, you will also find it on the Full Right website. We will announce it also. We have now come to the end of our uh, Cultural Exchange and Creative Communities webinar. Fulbright's Greece thanks you all for joining in today. And our warmest thanks to all our, to our guest speakers and to the uh, Santa Fe Art Institute. I'm sharing my screen so that all of you can see our Fulbright side. And we remain, uh, if you have any questions or any further inqu inquiries, you can reach out to us anytime. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thank Bye. you. Goodbye.